Have you ever wondered how you can incorporate hardware into your home studio setup? Well, today we're going to show you how to do that, and we're going to listen to some examples, so stick around. Hello Internet, Chris Klein here with Alamo Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. And as I said in the opening, we're going to look at hardware units today from Warm Audio and how we can incorporate these into our home studio setup using our favorite DAW, in this case Pro Tools, and the Apollo X4 interface. Now, before we can really move on, we actually have to make some physical connections because we are dealing with the physical world at this point, analog pieces of gear and not plugins. So let's take a look at the back of the Apollo and the back of these units, and let's get an idea of how we're gonna make these connections happen. Okay, let's do that. So right now we're looking at the back of the Apollo X4, and if you notice, I've removed the Thunderbolt cable as well as the power cable, just so we can focus on the inputs and the outputs for our hardware. Now, once again, you need to make sure that the console uh, within the UAD software, the console software, and the inputs and outputs are configured correctly, as well as the inputs and outputs or the I.O. configuration for Pro Tools before we really get into any of this, because if we don't do that, these things are not going to communicate properly, okay? So let's just assume that we've done that or that you've already read the article. So if you see here, we have our mic line inputs. In this instance, we're using the line aspect, and it's a dual... Uh, input, XLR and line. So we have our line inputs one and two, which are being fed from the outputs of the warm product that we have. Right now, the, um, the warm optical compressor or the WA-2A and the WA-76. So we have the output of the WA-2A WA -2A feeding the input mic line number one of our Apollo, right? And then we have the input of the WA-2A being fed from line out number one. So input to the Apollo is coming from the output of the WA-2A, and the output is coming from the input of the WA-2A. And we did the same thing with the WA-76, the 1176 clone. So we're going from mic line input number two. It's coming from the output of the 11 or the WA-76, right? And then line out number two is going into the input of the WA-76. And that's how we set up our hardware. Now, within Pro Tools or whatever your DAW is, you might have different ways that you establish the, uh, the digital connection, if you will, by inserting the insert. But once again, you have to set all that stuff up within your DAW, uh, in this case, Pro Tools, and with the UA console software. And then in the demo, of course, I'm going to show you how to engage or instantiate the hardware insert within the Pro Tools interface. So let's go ahead and skip to that now. So now that we understand how to make these physical connections between our interface and the uh, rack units from Warm, let's go ahead and listen to them and see how they're going to work with different program material. And of course, we're going to start off here with Warm's version of the legendary LA-2A from Teletronics, the Warm WA-2A, which is an optical compressor. Now, if you've seen our last video, we talked a little bit about how this compressor works. Well, today, we're actually going to listen to it. We're going to turn some knobs. We're going to run some audio through it, vocals, a snare drum, a guitar, some other, other tracks or other bits of audio to see how it actually sounds and how it works. So let's go ahead and get to the WA-2A right now. So first, what we're going to listen to is uh, Cooper Greenberg, who, who's on our guitar channel. And this is actually from something that we recorded a while back. There is a little bit of bleed of the, of the guitar in this vocal track, but we're going to listen to Cooper's uncompressed vocal. And then I'm going to run it through the WA-2A. And I'm going to kind of mess the peak reduction a little bit there so you can kind of hear what's happening uh, to the vocal, how it's being compressed more or less as I adjust the peak reduction. So. Let's go ahead and listen to the uncompressed signal first. So I'm already recorded and we are armed. So let's go ahead and do this. When we talk like this, you feel like a stranger. But I get excited when you're that way. I seen your face a time or two. Every time it seems so new. But nothing else can be that easy. Now next we're going to listen to the warm WA-2A 
compress Cooper's vocal. Now we talked about the inputs and the outputs on the back of the Apollo and our, our rack pieces, but we haven't actually inserted it into our session yet. So that's pretty simple. What I'm gonna do is go here to my inserts. I'm gonna click on one of the uh, five, uh, five rows, and then we're gonna go to IO. And we're going to add insert one, mono. So now when I play this back, what you're gonna hear is the warm compressor actually responding to Cooper's vocal. And I am also going to manipulate the peak reduction on the warm compressor so you can hear how that changes the audio or Cooper's vocal, the dynamic range. So let's go ahead and listen to that. So once again, we're going to run the audio, except we have the insert instantiated right here, which is gonna feed the WA2A. Now, as I'm recording the audio, I'm gonna mess with the peak reduction and you're gonna hear how Cooper's dynamic range changes. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. When we talk like this, you feel like a stranger, but I get I'm turning the peak reduction way up. Bring it back. I've seen your face a time or two. Every time it seems so new, but nothing else can be that easy. So now we're going to listen to a, a solo guitar track, uh, and I want to give everybody credit, uh, of course, where credit is due, from a band from the Bay Area called We Assure Dedicated. Uh, I actually didn't record this. This was recorded at the Seaside Lounge. Uh, in New York, and I mixed this album at home uh, using some of the same equipment, actually. Uh, not these exact units, but I have similar stuff at home. But anyhow, we're going to listen to this guitar. It's a Telecaster going through a deluxe reverb, if I'm not mistaken, uh, recorded with a Royer 121. Now, like we did with the vocal, we're going to listen to the WA-2A, and then we're going to listen to the 1176. So I'm going to go ahead and play this portion uncompressed so you can hear what it sounds like before we actually affect it uh, the dynamic range with our compressors compressors excuse me so here we go So now that we have our uncompressed audio, let's go ahead and run it through the WA-2A. And I'm gonna do the same thing that I did with the vocals. So as it's playing through, I'm gonna adjust the peak reduction a little bit so you can hear it compress a little more heavily and then open back up to a little more dynamic range, just so you can get an idea of how the guitar is going to react, or excuse me, how the compressor is going to react to the program material. So once again, WA-2A is insert number one. There we go. Let's prime for recording, and now let's listen to what's gonna happen with the WA-2A. I'm gonna turn up the peak reduction. I'm gonna bring it back. Now, with that compressor, you will notice that you don't necessarily hear it clamping down really, really fast on the attack of the guitar. And we don't want to lose that uh, uh, articulation of the guitar. And that's why a lot of people like the WA-2A is because it's very, very musical in how it lets the performance still shine through from a uh, dynamic standpoint. It's not clamping down on the attacks real, really quickly. Now we might want that in some cases. And with the 1170, or excuse me, with the WA-76, we can certainly do that by manip manipulating the attack and the release. And so let's go ahead and listen to that here in a second as well. So before we look at other or listen to other program material with our compressors, these are not the only two compressors that exist in the physical world. There are so many different flavors but these are very, very common compressors, and that's why we're exploring these today. And we're gonna pump some more information through them, so let's go ahead and move on to a bass DI track. So if we go back here into our session, 
and I'm going to go ahead and find a spot that's going to work for us. So this is an interesting bass part because there's a little bit of fret noise in here, but that's okay. We're going to live with it because we're really focusing more on the compressors and not so much the bass performance. Um, so let's do this. And once again, I'm going to go ahead and disable our insert. And I'm going to go ahead and record the uncompressed bass part so we can all hear it together. We're primed and here we go. So now we have our uncompressed audio. And once again, this is a DI track or a direct input or direct injection. Uh, it depends on what kind of vernacular you use. So we're going directly into a preamp and we're not going through uh, a bass amplifier. So the first compressor we're going to listen to once again is the WA-2A. This is actually personally my favorite bass compressor, uh, the LA-2A that is, the warm compressor also does an absolutely fantastic job. And the thing that's cool about the warm WA-2A is you can buy about five or six of these for what one uh, original LA-2A might cost you, if not more if you're getting like an OG from the 60s. So let's go ahead and insert uh, our hardware insert, number one, once again. And I'm gonna play with the, excuse me, I'm gonna play with the peak reduction uh, again, so we can hear it compress a little more and a little less. So let's go ahead and prime for recording. And here we go. I'm turning up the peak reduction and you can hear it's really squeezing on it. I'm gonna loosen it back up. And for those of you that are paying attention, you can actually see in the waveform, and I'll zoom in. Let me get some of this other clutter out of the way. When I turn up the peak reduction, well, you can actually see what's happening here in the waveform, right? Our dynamic range is being compressed. Visually, right? It's being compressed as well as audially, right? So it's nice to have this visual rep representation in your DAW. And you also have your meter as well on uh, some of these units, particularly the compressors. But what you really, really need to focus on, and when I say focus, I'm not talking about using your eyes. We need to get our eyes off of the screens a little bit more. But using our ears is how these compressors are actually working the audio. We need to be listening and not looking. Because at the end of the day, this is going to possibly influence the way you're hearing in the moment. When you step away from the DAW and you don't have that visual, not so much. You're just fully using your ears. You are listening. And you need to focus on that a little bit more. Maybe you want to close your eyes when you start experimenting with some of these pieces of gear so you're not looking at what's happening on the DAW or to your waveform or with the meters, but you're just based, you're looking with your ears. That's so important. So now we're going to listen to a snare drum. This is just the top of the snare drum. You are going to hear bleed. While it's not a lot of bleed, some people don't like bleed at all. And so they might gate it or use a couple of other tools that exist in Pro Tools. I'm a drummer myself. I'm a big fan of hearing the bleed between the microphones because that's what a drum set sounds like. If I put my ear where that microphone is living, well, I'm gonna hear the other drums as well. I'm gonna hear the interplay of all these different microphones and all the drums that exist on the kit. So I'm not gonna get too much into that philosophy. Let's go ahead and record the uncompressed snare track. So I'll prime it and here we go. Uncompressed snare. Now, I don't believe I've said this before. If you look here at where I'm dumping the tracks, 
These are stereo tracks. However, the tracks that we're grabbing, our source track that we're grabbing the information from is mono and it's panned up the center. So of course, then it's gonna be summed accordingly here, right? So what we're hearing is it's being distributed between both the left and the right channel equally. So we still have a mono signal, even though it is a stereo track. Now, again, as I had stated uh, earlier in this video and in the compression video that um, we just released, the, the WA-2A and an LA-2A is definitely a program-dependent compressor in every way imaginable. We can't adjust the release and attack time. Again, that lends itself to being a little more musical, but if you want a little more control over your dynamic range, an optical compressor like the WA-2A or the LA-2A might not be the flavor you want. And it might also add different coloring that you're not looking for, but the same thing can be said about the WA-76 or any other box that exists in the world. Again, it's up to you to listen. And speaking of listening, let's go ahead and listen to how the WA-2A is going to respond to a snare drum, and I'm also going to manipulate the peak reduction as it's playing through. Here we go, and I've already got the insert engaged. Prime for recording. Turning up the peak reduction. The more. And now I've got it maxed. And now I'm gonna bring it back. Now if you look here, we actually almost have like this hourglass type of thing happening, which directly correlates to how I was manipulating the peak reduction or turning the peak reduction up to get the gain reduction to be a little more extreme. So next up, we're gonna look at Warm's WA-76, which is a classic of the Yuri 1176. This is a FET-based compressor. And again, we talked about this in the last video a little bit. It's gonna be colored differently than the WA-2A. It also gives you uh, more functionality as far as, or more tailorability, if you will, if that's even a word, tailorability. We're gonna, that's gonna be a word moving forward on um, how you can actually sculpt your material. You can, you can uh, adjust the ratio, the input and output, which, which the input is your threshold, the attack and release time. Remember, all these things are program dependent up here. Again, everything's program dependent, but with the 1176, we can actually manipulate a lot of the parameters that we can't on the WA-2A, but you also need to listen to how it's changing their signal. So let's do that. So now we're gonna to listen to the WA-76 and how it's going to respond to Cooper's vocal. Now, um, just for the, the sake of this not getting too long, I'm going to uh, put the warm compressor at a, a ratio of eight to one, which, might be heavy handed for uh, some people as far as vocal compression is concerned. Uh, once again, for every eight dB that goes over the threshold on the, on the WA-76, uh, single dB is going to be output that's over the threshold. So let's go ahead and listen to the WA-76. And I'm gonna go ahead and make a couple of corrections over here. I'm gonna go ahead and put it in eight to one. I've got the meter set to gain reduction. We're gonna have somewhat of a medium attack so we don't clip too much of uh, the transients. We wanna have a little bit of that. And then the release will have a somewhat uh, medium release as well. So let's do that. And then I need to change in Pro Tools my insert to insert number two. There we go. And you're probably going to immediately hear the difference between the WA-2A and the 1176. I'm also gonna manipulate the input and output knob a little bit. Remember on the, on the WA-76, the threshold is fixed and it's governed by how much I'm feeding into the input, right? So it's already ready to go. So let's go ahead and record our audio again. When we talk like this, I'm gonna bring up the input. You like a stranger, but I get and now it's excited really working. And you're that way. I seen your face a time or two. I'm gonna make the release Every a little faster. time it seems so new. That's quite a bit. Nothing else can be that easy. So you will probably also notice that the color changes a little bit and 
it's just it's just a different sonic characteristic altogether with the 1176. Uh, but it's one that you will have to sit down and experience for yourself with your own ears using different program material. So let's turn off insert number one and plug in insert number two, which is our 1176. And I'm going to bring this back to a ratio of four to one on the 1176 for a guitar. I'm going to go ahead and record it. I'm going to play with the input once again, just to get more uh, uh, compression out of it, because once again, remember on the, the WA-76, our threshold is fixed. It's dictated by how much we're feeding into the input. But I'll mess with the attack a little bit so you can hear how it's going to clamp down a little bit faster on the attack of the guitar. And here we go. Let's prime it. So that's my fastest attack. I'm make it slower. So you can actually hear it responding a little bit after the guitar is actually first strummed. And like I did with the guitar, I've got the input uh, already set. I'm not going to really manipulate that, but what I am going to do is play with the attack a little bit and the release. Uh, I want you to hear how it's going to change the way the bass feels. Uh, I'm compressing it four to one and I'm going to prime for recording. I'm going to move this out of the way so you can see it again. And here we go. Fast, fast attack. Slower attack. Fastest release. Slower release. And you can see it's significantly more uniform now as well because I wasn't manipulating the threshold and having it compress more. I was just messing with the attack a little bit. If we were to zoom in, we could probably see those transients being manipulated a little bit more, but we're not going to go quite that deep, not just yet. So let's go ahead and listen to the snare once again. Prime for record. Bring the input up even more. Now, the attack, you can kind of hear almost like a pop. I, I brought the input a little, up a little bit more because I wasn't quite getting what I wanted to at the beginning. And you can actually see that in here, how the dynamic range changes, right? Now, I wanted to hear more of like the snap, which again, is really, really common with a uh, FET style compressor. The DBX160VU does it really, really well. And if you give it too much, it can kind of can destroy the tone and the attack of a snare drum, but it's very, very effective. You don't have quite as much control with the 160VU as you do with this. And another popular compressor for manipulating drums is going to be a Distressor by Empirical Labs, which is actually available as a plug-in on the UAD platform. Very, very cool compressor. So next up, we have Warm's EQ PWA, which is a recreation or a revisioning of the classic Pooltech EQ P1A. Uh, they're very, very similar, except Warm gives you more EQ points than the original. Um, I'm not going to say which one sounds better or worse because they're, they are slightly different. And if you go online, you'll find lots of mods that are out there already for a Warm's version. But out of the box, this EQ smokes and it's significantly less than an original Pultec or one of the newer recreations from Manly. And there's any number of companies out there that are making uh, Pultec style EQs. But this is an amazing tube EQ, especially at this price point. I'm gonna quit talking about it and let's listen to it. Now, the EQ PWA, once again, is a recreation of the Pultec EQ P1A which is a fantastic 2BQ, sounds really, really amazing. You can actually get a lot out of it, especially on the high end without it being too harsh in a lot of instances. If you have weird signal and you're trying to boost 5K, 10 dB, there's a good chance you might lose your eyebrows. Uh, but with 
these two BQs, especially the EQP1A or the EQPWA, you can get a lot of high end out of it many times without it being really, really harsh, which is really, really cool. It also just magically makes the signal jump out of your monitors a little bit whenever you engage it. Now, before we start boosting and cutting with the uh, 2BQ, the EQPWA, we're gonna listen to the, the uh, unaffected bass signal, if you will, once again. So let's go ahead, and let me make sure I have the insert turned off so I don't fool my ears and all of you watching. Uh, let's turn off the insert, and let's go ahead and listen to the non-compressed bass. So let's go ahead and prime, and here we go. Okay, so now we're going to add the warm EQPWA into uh, the mix, if you will. So let me go ahead and instantiate hardware insert number one. And once again, I'm gonna tweak the EQ as it's playing through, and um, I will let you know what, exactly what it is that I'm doing. I can tell you right now, uh, right from the onset, I've got the uh, low end of the EQ is set to 100 cycles and then I'm gonna go ahead and move around a little bit. So let's go ahead and listen to what happens to uh, 100 cycles on the e with the EQPWA. Here we go. Now you can feel that bottom end getting pretty heavy, as well as you can see the signal jump. Let's take it out, bring it back in. Let's cut it. Oh, it's getting anemic. Let's go to our top end, 5K, with a pretty broad Q or bandwidth. We'll start to turn that up. You can really hear that fret noise now. Bring it back down. Now once again, the EQPWA offers more EQ points than the original EQP1A. It's almost like they blended the MEQ5, which is the mid-band pull tech, and the EQP1A together. They didn't give you full functionality, the MEQ5, but there's a little bit of those points there. So it's a really, really great EQ package, uh, especially at this price point. The last instrument that we're going to listen to today is a Rhodes piano. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the Rhodes, maybe when you hear this, you'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard this on Herbie Hancock and uh, Chick Corea and countless other uh, pianists and um, jazz and rock gods. So let's go ahead and listen to it unaffected first or not EQ'd. So let me go ahead and prime the transport, and then we will go ahead and record the signal. Ah, such a great sound. It never, ever, ever gets old. And I can remember when the DX7, the Yamaha DX7 came out and everybody used that Rhodes patch that existed on there for a long time and like countless jazz fusion and smooth jazz records. And it kind of destroyed the, the, the Rhodes for a bit. And now the Rhodes is really, really back. It has been for a while. It's so nice that they're back. I have one in my home studio. Sounds so great. Um, so let's listen to it EQ'd. And the first EQ we're going to listen to, once again, is the EQPWA from Warm, the 2BQ. So I'll go ahead and insert one, prime for record. Let's get that out of the way so you can see as well as hear what's happening. Uh, the first frequency I'm going to boost is 400 cycles. And then I'm going to mess around the top end a little bit as well at 5K. And then I'm going to cut 10K as well. So let's go ahead and listen to what happens. So we're primed for record. Everything's good. Here we go. So that 
that 400 really adds some meat. 5K. A little more attack. And then cut at 10K. And it really takes away the presence, the top, top presence. And you can see what happened to the signal. It changed quite a bit from the original. We boosted substantially. Um, and again, that shows off the efficacy of the 2BQ and that you can boost quite a bit, get a lot more out of whatever it is that you're looking for with it, without it becoming too, too overwhelming. Now, I didn't boost the low end too much because if I did that, it would have started to distort and that would have overcome just about everything. But I gave it just enough. And then last, but most certainly not least, is Worm's version of the classic Neve 1073. Now, Worm's version uh, has the same, if you look at it, it, it feels and looks very similar to Neve's 1073 preamp and EQ. You've got the same style of knobs, you have the RAF blue, which is Royal Air Force blue. You can insert the EQ, you can take it out, you can change the polarity, it has phantom power, so it is a preamp as well. But today we're just going to listen to the EQ and what the EQ is going to sound like, once again, across different program material, vocals, guitar, so on and so forth. This is such a, a killer box, and I can't stress it enough. 1073 is really, really fetched quite a bit um, online. If you can get an original, uh, of course, you can get uh, one of the new... Uh, Neve recreations, uh, the Rupert Neve designs up in Austin, they're not doing 1073 style uh, preamplifiers and EQs. They have other flavors now, but there are no shortage of 1073 clones on the market today. And Warm is one of those that's, that's offering um, a, a very, very similar product. And they even have a stereo version of it as well. So again, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna talk too much. Let's just get to it and listen to it and see what it's gonna do to our signal. So now we're going to jump down to the WA-73, which once again is Warm's reimagining of a Neve 1073. This is a preamp as well, a mic inline preamp, but we're only going to listen to the EQ and we're using it as an insert. So we're not really recording anything through it per se. I mean, we are recording back into here, but we are utilizing it as an insert. You're going to notice that this is significantly different than the uh, EQP WA, which this is tubes. This down here is solid state, class A. It runs pretty hot. And the components, the electronics, uh, the circuitry uh, is significantly different than the tube EQ. So let's go ahead and listen to the, uh, the bass once again, uh, un-EQ'd. Oh, we've already done that. We don't need to do that again. Let's listen to it EQ'd. And I've got some, some EQ points on here already engaged. So if we're looking at our EQ points for our low end, which is shelving, we've got it set to 110. Uh, for our mid, we're set to 700 cycles. And then for our top end, we're set to 10K. Now on a 1073, a proper Neve 1073, your top end is set. All you have is boost and cut, and it's set at 10K. Here you can actually adjust the top end and it goes from 10 to 12 to 16. So you can really get a lot of air in there, but I have it set at 10 and I'm gonna crank it up so you can see how harsh it gets. With the EQ PWA, it doesn't get quite as harsh when you, when you boost that top end, but here it can. I'm not saying that that's bad. You just need to be a little more cognizant of what you're doing. You know, if you've been playing drums and shredding, you know, Marshall plexis for decades and not using uh, any, some, some type of um, safety for your ears, earplugs of some kind, there's a good chance that a lot of that top end is gone and you probably need to boost it a lot. And that is not necessarily a good thing. So let's listen to what happens to the bass as I boost and cut at these frequency, uh, uh, Knee, uh, knee frequencies once again. So 110, 700, and 10K. And insert two is already engaged, which again is our WA-73, and we're gonna go ahead and record, and prime, and here we go, recording. So 100 cycles boosted, and then cut. And we'll bring it back up to null, 700 boost, 
gets a little nasally and honky, and we'll cut it. That low end really comes through now. Bring it back to null, and then 10K. And you can hear a bunch of noise, the noise floor that exists. Bring it back. So a very flexible EQ sounds really, really nice. And when you get into the 1073, a new 1073, you're gonna pay a lot of money per channel, especially if you're going for OG 1073s uh, from the 70s, not, not necessarily uh, many of the clones that exist today. And some of them are, are really fantastic and really true to form. This changes the, the, the flavor and your EQ points, once again, a little bit, giving you a little bit, uh, giving you more options than you have with the original. So next up, we're gonna take a kick drum signal and run it through our WA-73. I love the flavor of a WA-73 or a 1073 on all my drums, on guitars. It just sounds like rock and roll. It adds a lot of really, really great meat into the signal, even if you don't EQ anything, just running your signal through the electronics already does something pretty darn special. And Warm has done a fantastic job of capturing that mojo. So let's take a kick drum, and this is on the inside of a kick drum, not on the outside. You're gonna hear a little bit of bleed, but let's go ahead and take our kick drum signal, and we're gonna EQ it. First, we're gonna listen to how it sounds without any EQ, and then we're gonna tweak it, and we're gonna make it be a little more beefy uh, by scooping out some mid-range and then we're going to add some top into it to capture a little bit of that attack. But again, let's listen to it before we process it. Here we go. Prime for record and... And we want to capture a lot of this so we can play with the EQ and you can really hear how it's going to affect the tone of the kick drum. It's recorded beautifully, by the way. And again, you can still hear the bleed and everything because that mic is not completely isolated from all the other drums. Even though it's inside the kick, we can still hear the overheads coming through a little bit, a little bit of snare, the toms. And there really isn't a whole lot of snare uh, as we're going through that. So we're using the WA-73 for, for the kick drum once again. I'm gonna go ahead and instantiate the hardware insert, IO, number two, and here we go. So I'm gonna start off by getting rid of some of the mid-range before I do anything else. And I've got my mid-range, uh, the knee frequency is set at 360. So, prime for record once again, here we go. And you can already feel just through subtractive EQ that low end coming, coming through a little bit more. And we're gonna boost our low end. Not too, too much. And then I'm gonna come over to our top end here in a second. And we're gonna get some more attack out of it. Take out a little more of that mid range. A little more low end. There we go. Once again, we can even see how the EQ has affected our original signal. If you look up here, you can see it's really consistent. We look down here as I started getting rid of some of that mid-range that existed at 700 cycles, it started to decrease the overall amplitude or the power of the kick signal. And as I started to incorporate 60 cycles or 60 hertz, and then 10K, you can see that we kind of restored a little bit of that power or the amplitude in the signal. One of the things I haven't mentioned yet about the WA-73 is that it also incorporates a low cut or high pass filter. Haven't used that yet. I'm gonna stay away from it from, I'm gonna stay away from it for this demo, but I am gonna get a little more radical with my EQ uh, for the roads uh, over here um, where we have a little more control. 
and I have it set to 220 for my low shelving. And I'm going to uh, boost that for our um, mids. I've got it set to 700. I'm going to boost that. Then I've got 10K set over here like we did on the uh, pool tech style. I've got it set over here on the w WA-73 as well. And I'm going to cut quite a bit of that. And you're going to hear it's a little more extreme. This is also shelving as well, the top end. So let's go ahead and put the proper insert in. So let's instantiate insert number two. Let's get rid of that. Let's make sure we're primed. And here we go. So boosting 220 doesn't take much to get away from you real fast. 700. And then we're going to cut the 10K. So it actually becomes pretty muddy when we, when we subtract that 10K. It really takes away a lot of it. And you can actually see here, as well as we could have heard, I was actually pushing it a little too hard, so it started to clip a little bit as well. But I want to give you a better idea of how radically different these two EQs are from each other. And once you incorporate them into your own setup, whether it be hardware or plugins, you're going to find out probably pretty quickly, if your ears are, are pretty dialed in already, that you're going to like this significantly more for broader strokes, and you're going to like this a lot more for more surgical strokes or just to have it inserted into your signal to give whatever instrument you're sending through it, a classic Les Paul through a Plexi or a 1200 or an Orange, you might find that without even EQing it, it gives you the meat that you're looking for. Cool? So I certainly hope all of this made sense to you today and that you were able to effectively hear uh, how our signal was being changed as we move through the different product with our dynamic range processors and our EQ processing. Uh, they're all such stellar, stellar rack units, uh, especially at this price point. You know, when you start getting into Manly and Summit and some of these other companies, you're getting into thousands and thousands of dollars where uh, Warm is offering a lot of this stuff at, at, at a pre-1K or below that 1K threshold, which says quite a bit. Uh, everything's made in Austin. It's American-made, using great components, Cinemag transformers, uh, all kinds of great tubes. It, it's just really up to you to dive into this product and to incorporate it into your home studio setup or into your commercial studio setup and really understand how these pieces are going to work for you, uh, depending on what type of content you're trying to produce. Um, we also have a blog post online that talks about uh, setting up your, your Apollo X4 with Pro Tools. It's a step-by-step -step instruction on how you manipulate the console software from Universal Audio as well as the I.O. Uh, within your uh, setups and Pro Tools. If these two things are not set up properly, they are not going to communicate, and you might get input or output but not both. So we have provide, uh, provided a detailed step-by-step -step guide on how to make this happen with images as well. So please feel free to use that. Once again, if you have any questions or issues about what may or may not be working, you can communicate with me or any of us here online or down in the comments below. Again, let's have a healthy discussion about how we can make these things work for us. Um, and with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and close this out. Uh, once again, I'm Chris Klein with Alma Music in San Antonio, Alma Music Center in San Antonio. Uh, please remember to look at our guitar channel, piano channel, bass channel, and accordion channel. And I know that Zach will be back soon with more synth goodness for you as well. And I've got a couple that are in the pipeline too. Um, we have a Patreon channel. You can go ahead and look at that and unlock other special features that's primarily geared towards our guitar channel. I'm sure we're going to follow suit with other channels as well, so let's just all uh, be patient with that. Uh, create, share, be kind to each other, love each other, uh, be safe out there. Uh, it's a crazy world right now. Until next time, Chris Klein, uh, looking forward to seeing you again. Thanks a lot. Bye.